Hello, I'm Fee from the Oxford Reading Hive team. Today I'm joined by the author of Private Peaceful, The Last Wolf, War Horse, and most recently, Flamingo Boy, to name just a few. It is, of course, the inimitable Michael Moore Pergo. Thank you so much for coming in. Good to be uh, here. This is a wonderful being able to, to get this sorted out. Um, I'm going to jump in straight with our questions because sure. we do have quite a few to get through. Yeah. So, starting off, um, what interested and inspired you to write, and what creatively inspires you now? There's two questions in one. Yeah, I've got to pack them in. Okay. <laughs> what inspired them to write in the first place? In the first place. Was um, the fact that I was a teacher. Okay. Um, I was a teacher in a primary school, and uh, I realised almost by accident that the way in which I could engage my class best mm -hmm. was to read them a story which I had loved. Right. That was critical. Yeah. One thing I learnt growing up is that. And my mother read to me, she read me stories and poems which she loved, and therefore she read them with a passion. Mm -hmm. So I did know that instinctively, that when you're reading or telling stories to children, you, you tell them as if you mean it, you're not pretending. So I did that, and it worked. The last half hour of every day, I did that. Yeah. And um, I loved it. It's the best hour, half hour of my day with mm -hmm. the kids, and it was their best half hour too. And then one day I began a book, and. Um, it wasn't working very well. I could see they were shuffling around and picking their noses, looking out the window. And it wasn't going very well. And I went back home and I said to my wife, you know, this book really doesn't work. It just does not work. I've done my best. And she said, well, don't go in there with a game tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You've bored them once already. Okay. Tell your own story. Mm -hmm. um, you're a pretty good liar. She said, <laughs> go in there and tell a story. You know, um, and it gave me the confidence to think that I could. Uh -huh. But it was also desperation because I'd failed the next day. It was a combination of those two things. Anyway, I lay awake all night and I made up the story. I went in there the next day at three o'clock and I started the story. And I found to my joy after about five or ten minutes that they were completely transfixed by it. Mm -hmm. And then I, as I was telling it, I realised why they were so engaged. Mm -hmm. It was because there was no book between me and them. Mm -hmm. And it was because I had made it up and therefore I really wanted it to work. And I believed in it. And I believed every word I was telling him. And then they believed it. Mm. And at the end of Hop Off Street, it was wonderful, the bell went and there was this, oh, <laughs> so I went on the next day and the next day. And I just loved storytelling after that. So mm. I didn't read other people's stories. To them, I made up my own. And one day, a head teacher came in and said, well, it's very good, Michael. I want you to write it out for me and give it to me on Monday morning. It was just like I was a kid of 10, you know. Yeah. So I did, and she knew someone in publishing, a publishing house called Macmillan. I know I shouldn't mention another publishing <laughs> house's name. <laughs> um, and anyway, um, it got published, and that's the way it all began. But it's sort of a happy accident, which was child-driven. Yeah. Essentially, it was to engage with children, um, and um, I found I had I could do that. Mm -hmm. Once you find you could do something and you love doing it, you just want doing it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so. And that's just because it's when you're writing, are you always thinking about sort of children as your audience then? Is that no, if you're not writing? At all. No, not okay. <laughs> well, I did, to be honest, I didn't then. Okay. Um, I think one thing you do know um, when you work with children as a teacher is you learn never uh, to speak to them as if they're 10 or 9 or 11. Mm -hmm. You talk to them straight, you look on there and you tell them a story as you want to tell it. Right. If they don't get part of it, that's fine. If they read other things into it, that's fine. But what you must do ever, ever, ever is to patronise them. You just tell it to them straight. And I learnt that really. They like being, if you're direct. Mm -hmm. And they like it if they know you mean it and it matters a mm -hmm. lot to you. Um, and the best teachers, when they read my stories, anyone's story, they, they, they don't read it as if they're reading to children. They read it for themselves. Yeah. And then the kids can see, hang on, she's really rather welling up. You know, yeah. things are going on in this teacher's mind. This teacher who's supposed to just talk to you is actually giving of herself or himself mm -hmm within the story to the mood of the children around and they respect that because it's that it makes the teacher vulnerable. Mm. And I think that's what it is really. It's, you know, what we're doing is passing on what we care about in this world. That's what writers do. And when children get that and they understand the directness of that and the honesty of it, mm. then I think um, that's when you make the connection. Yeah. Okay. Um, you obviously you've written, written many books now. Oh, it's far too many. Far too many, yeah. It's a bad habit. <laughs> Um, and we were just wondering, sort of, you must have a sort of well-established method of how you, how you write or sort of process. Can you, can you uh, explain a little bit about um, it? I wouldn't say it's a method. I think you just have, I've devised a, a sort of a cunning plan as a way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Partly helped by lots of other writers. Right. I was lucky enough to know when I was younger 
a wonderful writer who lived on the road called Ted Hughes. And I remember at one particular point I got stuck in the novel. And I was saying, I've got this, I don't know if it's a writer's block, he says, no such thing. Uh, he said, look, really the rule with writing is that you never sit down in front of a blank piece of paper or a blank screen or whatever. In, me, in my case, it's I write by hand. And um, he said, what you do is you do a lot of dream time. Right. And that's the most important part of writing. Never write a word, just have it in your head, have it in your head. Um, read around it, mm -hmm. um, think it through, dream it out. And only when you're really ready do you sit down and write once upon a time. Okay. Um, but what you don't do is stare at a blank piece of paper and make this huge effort to do it. Mm -hmm. he, he says it doesn't matter if a book takes you months or years to dream up. It's not the point. The point is that when you come to a piece of paper, you really want to get it done. And then the next thing I learned myself, because I was very inhibited as a child, I was rather frightened of words and I wasn't any good at writing at school. Mostly because you got marked and ticked off mm -hmm. and put in detention and stuff like that. And, and there were other children who were always clever and better at it, so you kind of we like it's, that. Yeah. We don't particularly like being humiliated in front of people. So I didn't really do it, and I learned really that I was frightened of putting words on paper. Mm -hmm. So I learned to tell them the story now, not to write it at all. I forgot about being a writer, I just told it now. And I learned to do it without caring who the audience was, mm -hmm. without caring whether it was neat, or whether it was punctuated, mm -hmm. or what the spelling was like. I learned simply to tell it down on a piece of paper, and then revise it. Sure, then write it out so I can read the stupid thing <laughs> and put in some punctuation so that I can breathe and, yeah. and make sure that it's spelled right, otherwise other people can't understand it. I mean, I get all that. It's just that to start that, with, yeah. it's rather like a painter sketching. You know, when, when you, you don't spend your time thinking of things, you just do, 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 do. And that's the way, and then the stories sort of grow as you write them. They're organic. And mm -hmm. the best stories I've ever written are the ones that grow um, literally without the plotting and the planning. So what I'd never, never do yeah. is to sit down and plan chapter by chapter by chapter, I just don't do it, I just tell the story. And that way the story finds its own voice. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really important, to find the voice before you start. But there does come that awful moment when you actually got to sit down and do it. You know? <coughs> and um, then it is this business of telling it down and telling it down. Big thing is you tell it down as if you're telling it to your best friend. Mm -hmm. And it's a confidence. Mm -hmm. You're not telling it out to the world, you're just telling it because the story means a lot to you and you're only telling it to someone you trust. In my case, I'm lucky, I've, um, I've lived with the same wife for about 56 years, um, so I give it to her mm -hmm. the first time. And um, she's the person I trust, so she comes back to me with her response, and I'll listen sometimes, sometimes I won't, or I'll get cross or sulk or something. <laughs> but at the end of the day, um, you give it to someone you trust mm -hmm. and see what they think, um, and then correct it a bit, maybe amend it if you've, there have been some good suggestions. That's a really interesting process, mm. because it's refining it, refining it. And then I sent it off to uh, some very lucky publisher. <laughs> um, so while I was sort of thinking about sort of character, you know, the book's voice, and so you create some very memorable characters. Um, are there any that have sort of remained with you after you've written them, and it's quite hard to sort of leave? And are there any that you'd maybe like to go back to and explore? Oh, there's a lot I'd like to go back to. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to tell you this because what you do find later on, when you come to read stories out to people, twenty years on, thirty years on you realize what you could have done better, which is deeply irritating, but there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so I won't talk about this okay. at, at all. Um, not because I'm ashamed of it, it's just that there's sort of no point. Mm -hmm. I just know I could have done better. I mean, I'll tell you about one book. I wrote a book called Friend or Foe, which is my first book um, that was ever at all um, successful. Is the right word. People read it, you know, and it got reprinted, so that's successful, I suppose, when you're the first writer. You to have your book reprinted is a big thing. You know? yeah. Anyway, so um, it was it was a story, okay, it was about two kids evacuated down to the West Country during the Second World War. A story inspired by my auntie who'd been a teacher and had gone down with some kids to the West Country from Islington in London to avoid the bombing. And anyway, so I used a lot of what she told me and I made the story. When I read it now, which I do from time to time, um, I find that the boys are just names. Right. That I did not manage to bring to them uh, distinctive enough personalities and motivation and stuff like that. Um, which is fine, you know, I was learning my trade. Um, but I'd change that mm -hmm. now. Um, I mean, I won't. But, <laughs> um, but I think what happens now is I, I, I'm better at creating characters, I think. And, but there's one in the book I wrote called Kensky's Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, 
And there's a character in it who is a Japanese um, sailor left behind on an island in the Pacific after the, at the end of the Second World War, 1945, uh, as indeed there were soldiers, Japanese soldiers and Japanese sailors. And many of them refused to believe the war was over, um, and they hid away on this island. My particular character is called Kensuke, and Kensuke has been living on this island, like Robinson Crusoe, yeah. for 20, 30 years. Um, and then this little English boy and he's sailing around the world with his parents on a sort of a family adventure, um, falls off the boat and finds himself on this island and is having to share the island with this, this old man now, this old Japanese veteran from the Second World War. And he's a modern English child. And they don't get on uh, for various reasons they don't get on. I mean, you've got this, he, he's a warrior from an ancient time, really. And he's a boy of today, and they're alarmed by each other, and they intrude on each other, they don't help each other. And the book is about how they learn to get on. And what Kensky has done is to devise a way of being on this island, of living in harmony with the world about him, and with, with nature, um, in terms of his food and all the rest of it. So he's, he treads very lightly on the planet. Mm -hmm. And he's devised a way of just simply living, and being, and doing a lot of thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, he doesn't like the disturbance of this little boy. <laughs> um, he's the man I most want to grow into, okay. I suppose. Mm -hmm. And that's because I'm getting, I'm not saying I'm going to an island, but I do respect enormously the, the solution that he's mm -hmm. found to living on this planet, which would be more and more so, more of us, I think, are discovering that this is the way to be, to live lightly on the planet. And in fact, I have to say, as we know, children are discovering this, you know, mm -hmm. we have to take care of the planet. And it is the, that should be our most important priority. Otherwise, there will be no planet on which we can live, sustain ourselves, or indeed sustain the, the creatures around us. Um, so it's become much more relevant than it ever was, and, and he's the person I would most like to be. Thank you. Um, so you've mentioned sort of a lot of books that have been about sort of children and their um, experiences of, of war. Um, why do you think it's particularly important for children to to read about? The war. Well, it's important for children to read about everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, what is the important thing about reading? Why am I sitting in, a, in, in this institution, this publishing institution, and you're spreading books all around the world? Why? What's the point of it all? Not just a business. It's uh, something much more important than that. What we're trying to do with books is to engage children with the world about them intelligently, mm -hmm. sensitively. S books, for me, are about empathy. It's about us all, not just children, all of us, um, learning about other peoples, other places, about the difficulties of, of life, the joys of life, um, finding our own place in the world. The wonderful thing about books is you can do this privately, you know, and there's a great contemplation that goes on with the business of reading a book. You lose yourself completely in other worlds, in other times, so you can go back in time, you can go forward in time, so young people get to know about older people, French people get to know about English people, English people get to know about Chinese people, whatever it is, you you learn about other peoples, and in this earth now, this planet, where we're all one family, whether we like it or not, we're all getting closer and closer and closer, it seems to me to be, it was always essential that we learn about mm -hmm. the world around us. Now it's becoming critical. We have to know about other people and how other people think. Mm -hmm. And it's fine if they don't think like us mm -hmm. and they don't believe like us. But you have to know these things and to know them through books. You can't, you can't go out and meet everyone in the world, you know. You can't go to every country in the world. It's ridiculous. In fact, if we do, if we get on planes and we fly around the world, we make the thing, you know, worse, mm -hmm. not better. But with books, you can learn so, so much um, because you can travel in these books. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, I think, is it teaches you so much about yourself. Mm -hmm. And the main thing it teaches you is that you're not alone. Yeah. Is that there are other people who have been lonely, have felt pain, have felt loss. So you mentioned in your question about war. Mm -hmm. well, why is war important? We'd rather not have war. So why, why write about it? Well, the fact is that we have had wars. So it's mm -hmm. been in, endemic in the whole sort of way in which people have been over centuries and centuries and centuries. Mm -hmm. And indeed it's going on in the world as we speak. To think that we could live in our nice little tiny little island um, and ignore it when you have what's going on in, 
in Syria or Yemen at this particular moment. But in 10 years' time, there'll be other places. And, and it's not just a matter of poor people suffering at the hands of yet another war. This has always gone on. Mm. And if you can create a world where young people think about it, uh, I don't want to indoctrinate them, I want to think. Yeah. So that when they do reach the point where they're making, these are the ones who are going to be making the decisions in this world, they have thought this thing through. Mm. And they know that bombing people because you don't like their tribe or their nationality or their religion or whatever is no way to solve anything, which seems to be what we fail to understand. Well, then books could do that. I mean, I genuinely believe books are a force for good in this yeah. world. Um, they can be a force for, for evil. Mm -hmm. You know, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf and um, did it with a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so you've got both. Yeah. There's propaganda, but there's also the kind of books that make that widen your horizons, deepen your thinking, and that's why they're important. And war is part, sadly, of the human experience as part of our history. And it's really important we know our history. Mm -hmm. One of the great problems we have in this country in particular is that we don't know our history. We think we do. We get a little nostalgic about having been frankly important in the world, you know, for 100, 150 years. And forgetting, actually, that we are a European little European nation on an island off the edge of Europe, and we've been engaged with this particular part of the world for forever. Uh, and then we sort of a bit, got a bit above ourselves which in one sense is really good. What's the only really good thing about that? And that's our language. It's our language that's spread around the world. Mm -hmm. And where does that language come from? If you know your history, you know it comes from Italy, it comes from Greece, it comes from Germany, it comes from France. These are places in a continent called Europe. <laughs> Weird. And it's that, but if you don't know these okay, things, yeah. why, how are you going to, how are you going to grasp what's going on in this world? Not just at the moment. Um, we've got to know these things. So, yeah, here's the books. Here's the books. Well, that actually takes us quite neatly on to the retelling of myths and legends, yeah. which is even further back in history. Um, as a storyteller, what do you think about when you're retelling an ancient tale? That I'm not retelling it, that you're I'm telling it for the first time. Okay. So that's really important. I mean, I know, this, the, we all know, because we've grown up with them, you grow up with Gawain and the Green Knight. Mm. Um, when did I first, I was first read that by my professor at King's College London, who was a dusty old man, and he'd sit on the corner of a desk in his tweets, you need read us this in the original language, mm -hmm. with unbelievable uh, conviction. Yeah. And it was just beautiful to, to listen to him. He was a hopeless teacher, but he was completely <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> about passing on what it was that he loved. Yeah. And would you realise that this thing had been written, I don't know, how many hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of years ago? Um, and uh, before that, been told and told and told and told. Um, it's one of these stories that's grown or organically. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, very, it's simply part of who we are. Mm -hmm. If you don't know these stories, you don't know you don't know who we are at all. So you, that soaks in, and then someone says, "Well, will you retell it?" So what do you do? You read it again. Then you put it out, mm -hmm. okay. and then you tell it as if you're the first storyteller that's ever telling it. You go back really to where you started from, which is telling it orally, mm -hmm. as I told you, and onto yeah. the page. <laughs> yeah. um, but that's but it has to be fresh. Yeah. The important thing is if you're just regurgitating, then there's no point in doing it. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to bring today and yourself into this story. Yeah. Um, Amelia wanted to know, one of your fans, um, what was it like seeing your novel War Horse on stage? Um, well, Amelia, um, what's it like? I saw it only the other day, <laughs> up in Stoke, for about the 40th time, so I do know it quite <laughs> well. <laughs> well, it's been on now for close to, I think, 12 years, and I think about 8 million people have seen it. Mm -hmm. And different casts, uh, so I go to meet the cast and um, talk to them about the origins of the story. Mm -hmm. And I'm immersed in it. Well, of course I am. It's been the most extraordinary thing to have. It's wonderful enough to have your book made mm. into a play or into a film or whatever. That's wonderful enough because it takes on another shape and another voice. And, and to me, that's always interesting mm. what people make of their stories. Yeah. With this, I mean, it's very interesting talking about it with, with, with Joey here. Yeah. Because when the, they first approached me, the National Theatre, you know, yeah. um, said they wanted to make a play of this, but they wanted to make it with puppets. Um, I just thought it was ridiculous <laughs> because, well, we've all seen horses on on stage and they're pantomime horses. Yeah. 
they're funny. Yeah. Um, and this is a story, a very serious story, and a deeply sad story in many ways, about the First World War. I could not see how you could get over the whole business of Bertha Van Bors, mm -hmm. until I saw the work of these puppeteers, yeah. hands being puppets, um, and the puppeteers who become invisible as you're, as you're watching it. And uh, I mean, I like animals, and I, I'm not passionate about them. I'm really interested in the relationship between men, women, and animals, mm -hmm. children, and animals. And what's wonderful is seeing how men, women, can create mm -hmm. an animal out of themselves and bits of leather and yeah. bits of cloth. And how on earth does that work? I tell you how it works. It works because we bring our imaginative powers. Um, because we wish to believe this thing. Mm -hmm. And Warhorse is written in the first person. The horse yeah. tells a story, mm -hmm. which we know is pretty silly. Um, and if, if the book works, it works because you forget that within the first page. Yeah. The minute you think, hang on, is a horse talking, it's absurd, it's lost. They couldn't do that on stage. You couldn't have a horse standing and telling it. It simply wouldn't work. So yeah. they devised this notion, which I thought was stupid. Um, <laughs> and then I saw these puppets. And they became, of course, the voice of the horse, the eyes of the horse, the heart of the horse, was the heart of us all. Mm -hmm. It's the universal observation, I suppose, on the situation that mankind mm -hmm. um, gets himself, herself into warfare. So this is a way of looking at that war, maybe for the first time, mm -hmm. um, from all sides. So you have some sense of the universal suffering of war. So you have a horse that's grows up on my farm in Devon, it's very personal. And horses were sold away to the army, taken away. The boy goes looking, Albert goes looking for, the, for his horse, so he joins up. And that's the kind of the, the way the thing works. But by this time, of course, the horse is in France. Mm -hmm. Now a cavalry horse, seeing the war from the British side, he gets captured mm -hmm. by the other side, by the Germans, who are enemies then, um, and sees the war from the German side. Grey uniforms, not khaki ones. And then Joey Winters on a French farm and sees it from the civilian French point of view, how their land's being fought over and blasted to bits and terrible suffering going on on all sides. And so you have a sense of this thing affects everyone just mm -hmm. the same. And he's the tenor of the story without ever opening his mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what the theatre did. It brought it to life in a totally different way with music and lighting and the most extraordinary design. I mean, the National Theatre got all the best people in, in British theatre, really. Mm -hmm and um, brought this thing to, to a whole new audience of people. And the lovely thing for me is that when literature for younger people breaks through the barrier, the glass ceiling, if you like, and becomes a story for everyone, mm -hmm. that's a great triumph. When children's books can do that, yeah. then, you, then you join families together. They can go and see the same thing together. They can read it together. Um, and I love that about Warhorse, it, it, it has done that. I mean, there are other there are great writers, you have one in the city of Philip Pullman, people who can write books where fathers, mothers, grandparents, children can read these books, and it means something yeah. to them all. It's yeah. not just for children, just for women, just for men. It's, it's a shared It's just, it's a and that's what storytelling yeah. to me should be. It's, so when I sit, at, as I did the other day in that theatre with, I don't know, 1,500 people up in Stoke, and there were kids of six and seven, and grandparents of 80 and 90, mm -hmm. and parents of 30, 40, 50, and old gits like me, and we just sat there. Mm -hmm. And everyone, everyone was bringing themselves imaginative to this theater. Mm -hmm. Their imagination was taking from this play and putting into this play, so that they were deeply, deeply engaged, but each of them on a slightly different level. Mm -hmm. So I have no doubt that what the kids were fascinated by was this horse and the goose and how wonderful they were and longing for the boy and the horse to be reunited. That's really what they cared about, you know? Mm -hmm. So they felt the sadness, but then you saw the adults in bits um, with tears and stuff like that, because many of those had already lived through grieving and loss, and some of them would have memories of war, and some of them might even have been to war. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it, the, the, the answer is that um, it's been a, a life-changing joy, and it's very nice to, at the age of about 60 to have your life changed. <laughs> you sort of need that. Yes. <laughs> um, Last, I don't think I could, I could get you here. That I am just wondering if you'd be able to share your top three tips for aspiring writers. Um, I admit, one, two, three. The, the first thing is to live an interesting life. Okay. I don't think you can't write and you live an interesting mm -hmm. life. Now that does not mean that you have to spend your time on planes travelling around the world. Mm -hmm. um, one of the best writers I know is a little boy called Jonathan Bryan 
who has um, since birth been completely unable to move or get up and he's been lying there and looked after wonderfully by his mother and his family and his teacher and, and he's learnt to read and to write by the most extraordinary way of blinking mm -hmm. his eyes at letters and can, can therefore now write. Mm -hmm. So he's done this massively with his mind and also, this is the second thing, you read a lot. Mm -hmm. So live an interesting life. He does live an interesting life, yeah. cerebrally, you know, mm -hmm. and because people bring the world to him and so he can interpret it, which I think is the most wonderful way of believing that stories, mm -hmm. story making is for everyone. In my case, um, I've tried to live an interesting life. I mean, I've um, I haven't set out to do it, but I was a child once, which is in a way the most interesting time because you're seeing the world for the first time, so the impact is all huge. Then you grow up, but I was quite a young father, and I had my own children, and then I was a grandfather, and I'm a great-grandfather, and I've moved about a bit in different places. I've had different professions. I've been a, um, after being a student, I was uh, I went into the army for a bit. I've been a, went then to, to university again. Then I became a teacher, and now I live on a farm. So all these things help yeah. you to become alive in your head. And then you read other people's books, other people's views of the world, other people's takes on it, and these things mixed together. And then I suppose after that, the most important thing is that you space, find space in your life to be peaceful yeah. and to think these things through. And I've already described how mm. I put my books together. It's not the best way of doing it, but it. The thing is not to be uptight about it. Mm -hmm. The truth is that we all have a story to tell. So the next thing after the third thing I would say is confidence. And the confidence to think, well, I can do this stuff. You, know, you don't have to be clever to do it. You have to want to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And you also have to remember, I think, when you're quite young, that one of the great joys in life, and I shouldn't be saying this because I know this is an education side of Oxford University, <laughs> but actually we all love telling tales. And yeah. sometimes these tales are called lies. And children are really good at this stuff. <laughs> And they're also very good at, I think, knowing the difference between a lie and a story. Mm -hmm. Telling a lie is not a good idea because it's deception, and deception isn't good. But if you put it in a book, <laughs> it's all lies. <laughs> but you can get away with it because it's in a book. And yeah. if they think of it a bit like that, and it's fun, it's got to be fun. Yeah. So telling your stories is such a joy. Um, I don't know, I've been a bit gabbly about it, but that's... <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, you can follow Oxford Reading Hive on Twitter. We're at, at Oxford Ed English. Um, we also now have the Facebook page, which is oh, ugh, Oxford Reading Hive for Secondary Schools. Quite a long title. Um, we share these videos as well as resources for schools who want to set up book clubs. So take a look, and we're here to help. And thank you very much for coming no, in. No, it's been a pleasure. Thank thank you. You. It's important to leave the children with the thought that there, there are plenty of good books out up there. They do not have to read mine, but if they don't, I shall be very offended. Okay, there we go. Don't upset Michael, please. <laughs> Thank you.